Red Brick Media. All quality CDs, DVDs, lectures, khutbah, conferences and Quran recitations. All revenue generated supports our Dawah work, supported by visiting our store. You can now purchase directly from our site www.redbrickmedia.co.uk Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Innal hamdalillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina min sayyiati a'malina Man yahdihillahu fala mudillalah wa man yudlil fala hadiyalah wa ashhadu an la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'du fa inna asdaqal hadithi kitabullah wa khayrul hadi hadi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam wa sharral umuri muhdathatuha wa kull muhdathatin bid'ah wa kull bid'atin dalalatin wa kull dalalatin fin nar rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli after praising allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending immense greetings and salutations upon the final prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam we enter into a topic which contains much neglect or ne- negligence from many of us a topic that many of us seem to put aside a topic that many of us seem to pay little attention towards because there's some teachings in islam which is academics academia to study and there's some elements of islam which are practical implementation and many of us we know quite a lot or we claim to know so much even though the quran mentions wama utitu min al ilmi illa qalila you've only been given a small amount of knowledge and yet we feel so proud a noble and arrogant of the knowledge that has been bestowed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us all. Knowing isn't necessarily a bonus point because we find inside the Quran, Ya you alladhina amanu lima taquluna ma la taf'aloon kabura maqtan inda Allahi an taqulu ma la taf'aloon So to say one thing and not to implement it is very grave is a big mistake in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those, there are certain elements that many of us, if not all of us, know. But we fail to implement them in our everyday application of Islam. And obviously the topic isn't one of Tawheed, one of Sunnah that we find. This is a, a daily application you can begin to conclude where our footing is in comparison to our understanding of Tawheed and the Sunnah wa ahsin kama ahsan Allahu ilayk show goodness like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed goodness to you and that you find in general you find amongst many of the ulama etc who write the concept of tarbiyah of cultivation of education a man in general is asked one or two questions for what they may have become today. Obviously, that's the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala originally, but in terms of this dunya. Who was your father or who were your teachers? Simple. Then at a later stage, you may have your own credentials of what you may have become or who you may be. But that's the beginning, the essence, is about one's parents. They either must have been some fine, some damn good parents who gave you some good tarbiyah, or you must have had some damn good teachers. And that's what we want to focus upon tonight, is that kindness that needs to return back to one's parents, that many of us have forgotten. At the moment, with all this credit crunch, etc., that you find, there's one business, I don't know here, but down south, that's thriving at the moment, and that's the old age pensioners' homes. To place your parents in a home, it's big business. One person 
they were charging him approximately 800 pound a week to keep him in a home 800 pound a week tasawwaru hada think about this paying to have your parents just put away from you sounds strange but you know many of us muslims or some of us muslims are following exactly the same methodology of thought because remember the wider community has a big influx a big input into the way it creates your character thus you know i'm not very startled at times to find that people with short thobes and flowing beards and faces covered that sometimes you find vile vulgar repulsive language coming out of their mouths and even cursing and swearing towards their parents it's not surprising shouldn't be something surprising because the whole culture breeds this concept of separating oneself from one's parents that i am a man in my own right who are they to tell me what to do what influence do they have upon me and we can see the fitna and the fasad that begin to take place that in the disguise of quote unquote islamic practicing that my father is no longer my wali on what criteria he doesn't pray he's not a good muslim according to you so now you are scout free to bypass your father and to marry whomever you want and if you go and study the fiqh of zawaj and the role of the wali that discussion may take place about etc does the person establish the prayer it does exist there but a large portion of the ownership of the wali remains upon the experience of life the father will never choose a person who's going to be corrupt or a person who's going to be not having the interest of his daughter at stake so the experience of life gives that father that wali that ability and thus you find that some men you find they have the the farasa the ability that the way that a man walks into a gathering is enough to analyze the individual and you can see what i'm referring to if you find a young muslim boy with his pants hanging down below and walking in and strolling in you can just in 10 seconds analyze what the lifestyle and the behavior and the character of this individual is so we want to return back to not just talking about fine creed and fine implementation of sunnah but fine character as well especially those individuals that many ulama have mentioned or highlighted that the sabab the reason for you being in existence in terms of any the natural process of birth etc is your parents so something has to be returned back to them and as any basic elementary student of quran knows that wherever allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the concept of tawhid and worship and ibadah we also mention something else وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Strange, isn't it? We always emphasize about Tawheed and then we forget to miss the, the ending of the ayah. Your Lord has decreed that you should worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you should show goodness to one's parents. وَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَاعْبُدُ اللَّهِ Worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Associate no partners to, towards him subhanahu wa ta'ala And then we find وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Strange again, isn't it? The call of Tawheed The coolness of oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Devoting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And then somehow we forget the second part of the ayah About showing goodness to one's parents Surah Luqman the surah the 31st chapter of the quran described as the surah of tarbiyah of cultivation there's certain main surahs inside the quran if you go back to them and you study them you'll find a great focus of khuluq of character of tarbiyah of cultivation amongst them you find surah al-hujurat the 49th chapter of the quran some of us they write if you want to create the ideal islamic society then implement these 18 verses the end of Surah Al-Furqan, the 25th chapter of the Quran, talks about the characteristics of Ibadur Rahman, what the characteristics should be upon this earth. Likewise, the beginning, the first 11-12 ayat of Surah Al-Mu'minun, the 23rd chapter, 
all talking about the character of the believer. Surah Al-An'am, we find teachings inside there. Surah Al-Isra, we find teachings inside there. And then we find inside Surah Luqman another concept of tarbiyah, of how Luqman in the salam says to his son, وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ Luqman gives an admonition to his son and the first teaching that he teaches him is Ya Bunayya la tushrik billah Never ever commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Inna shirka la dhulmun azim Shirk is the most biggest oppression that you can do upon yourself And thus we find in two locations inside the Quran exactly identical verses exactly inside the same surah on different instances Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushrika bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive the associating of partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and forgive whomever he wants other than that besides that subhanahu wa ta'ala so if a person dies upon shirk you've just sealed your own coffin إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَأْوَاهُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنْصَارِ so that's the Quran inside Surah Al-Ma'idah. Whoever commits shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it haram, haram, haram ala hadha shakhs, يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ We haven't made it haram. Books of Aqa'id haven't made it haram. The Quran has made it haram that the person who dies upon shirk, لا يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ will never enter into paradise. So that's the first tarbiyah that the, the father or the mother gives to the child to teach them about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the devotion, the commitment towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قُلْ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَبِذَلِكَ أُمِرْتُ وَأَنَا أَوَّلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Say my prayer, my sacrificing, my living, my dying is all dedicated towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I associate no partners in those actions and I submit myself amongst the first and fourth most individuals who submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we find in the same surah, the later stage, verse number 14, We enjoined upon him to show goodness to his parents. A legacy, a wasiya. You know, many times this word comes inside, inside the Quran. That indeed we did give wasiyah to the people before you and to you. And ittaqullah, to worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a legacy is like a will, something that remains for as long as this dunya will remain. That we've told you to be good, you need towards your parents. In another location we find this legacy continues inside Surah Al-Ankabut, the 29th chapter of the Quran. وَوَسَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حُسْنًا We've given the advice, the legacy, to human beings, to mankind, to show goodness, to show kindness to one's parents. Another location we find, وَوَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا We've given the legacy upon the human being to once again show kindness, goodness to one's parents. So this covenant was present previously as well. As we find inside the Quran, وَإِذَا خَدْنَا مِيثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ لَا تَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهَ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا We took this covenant from Bani Israel that you should only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you should be dutiful, bound to show goodness towards your parents. Also in prophetic teachings, in the ahadith, أَيُّ الْعَمَلِ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ سُبْحَانُ وَتَعَالَى which action is most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As salatu ala waqtiha. Prayer upon its prescribed time. Then what comes next? Thumma ay. Which am amal comes next? Birrul walidain. Showing goodness, kindness to one's parents. Thumma ay. Then which action? Then comes al jihadu fi sabilillah. Now think about that in quite detail. Prayer upon its prescribed times. 
ulama fuqaha begin to have a discussion if a person is offering a superrogatory prayer a nafila a sunnah should they break their prayer if their parents are calling them great discussion begins to take place depending on whether the need of the parents whether they can sustain themselves whether they need extra help etc but in general you find the simple answer is one can break their prayer and respond to the call and as you can read the famous in hadith as we mentioned about the person who didn't respond to the call of his mother and the curse that befell upon him something to think about if to such a degree that you're doing something superrogatory it's better to leave that action and to respond to the call of one's parents and also we study the quran closely even more closely we find that one specific parent is given preference over the other so if we return back to those ayat inside surah luqman verse number 14 to complete the puzzle to complete the ayah we find wasayna al-insana bi walidayhi hamalathu ummuhu wahnan ala wahan we've enjoined upon mankind to show good to his parents and in specific his mother hamalathu wahnan ala wahan his mother carried him wahnan ala wahna hardship upon hardship is something to reflect upon another verse we find wasayna al-insana bi walidayhi ihsana hamalathu ummuhu kurha wa wada'athu kurha we told you legacy to take care of one's parents show goodness towards them and the mother who carried him with hardship and brings him out upon hardship and then even more specific the quran then even goes to describe that what is this hardship that some of us have forgotten that no man can ever understand فاجاء المخاض الى جذع النخل she came to the tree and she grasped the roots or the branches of the tree the the main part of the tree qarat ya laytani mittu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasyam mansiya rama this is maryam alayhi salam had no relationship with any man in her life hasn't been married the pains of childbirth the pains of carrying the child the pains of what could happen in the future so she utters these words that become historic and for all women qalat ya laytani mittu qabla wa kuntu nasyam mansiya if only i died before this and was something totally forgotten and you study the science of the delivering of a child without that pain the child will not be delivered and no man will ever experience that pain and that come becomes a form of expiation for the mother for the woman and like christianity we study the ethics of christianity that bearing of a child and carrying of the child the men who strike etc is all signs of a punishment and a wickedness because she tempted adam alayhi salam to eat from the tree forbidden tree and because of that read the bible in great detail you find that this is the punishment that she has to face in this dunya but whereas islam sees it as a form of expiation a blessing and then for those 40 odd days afterwards does not have to offer the prayer etc is the blessings of islam and how islam sees the role any of the mother like was individual came and asked man ahqqu an-nas bi husn sahabati ahqqu bi husn suhba man came and asked that who has the most right for my companionship for me to show goodness towards who has that most right qala ummuk your mother thumma man qala ummuk thumma man qala ummuk thumma man qala abuka sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said your mother then whom your mother then whom your mother then whom your father tasawwaru hada think about this the prophet muhammad said that three separate occasions to him and he's asking three separate questions who has the most right for my ultimate companionship and goodness your mother your mother your mother and then your father abdullah ibn umar in relation to this verse that we mentioned at surah luqman some mufassirun have mentioned this as well the abdullah ibn umar and he saw a man carrying his mother on his back and performing the tawaf so when he saw abdullah ibn umar radiyallahu anhu he approached him and said to him you know do you think i fulfilled the role of my mother 
the duties that I owe to my mother. You know what Abdullah ibn Umar said to him? You carrying it on your back and performing tawaf is not even equivalent to one contraction of the many contractions she had on many nights. Something to think about. And even recently, if you study the, the earthquake that took place inside Kashmir, etc., there's one individual, and you cannot even imagine this point of respect towards one's parents. And if us, it sounds too cultural. One son carried his mother for a whole day, brought her to the doctor, got her treated, picked her back up on his back, and walked all the way back home. Mushmaqul, you can't even imagine something like this. It's not possible for some of us living in the Western world to think that we would do something like that. To carry on his back, to get her treated, lift her up again, and finish. But what do we find inside our society? Reviling, cursing. Uffin. Quran says, don't even say uff. Uff, you know, that's a big word in the Arabic language. Big word, don't even say that. And what do we find in our society? Abi Jahil. My father's ignorant. My father doesn't know. What does my mother know? What do they know about life? What do they know about experience? Thus you find that psychologists write this concept about what many of us that we're living inside this society as well, that we become too full of ourselves. And you find that when a person has a child, you find that in general the child thinks that, you know, using the word linguistically and in this dunya that, you know, my father knows everything, whatever topic he talks about. But as the child begins to get slightly older, he thinks that, you know, I know 20%, 30% of things that my father doesn't know. You know, when it comes to his Xbox and PlayStation, and he, as you get older, it becomes difficult to keep your fingers and move your fingers so fast and they know all the games, etc., and everything that exists around us in this society. Then when they get to their teens, most children, they think, you know, well, he's foolish. I know more about the world and the, around me, etc. And when they hit they need the age of 19, 20, finish. I'm more important than my father. That's the psychological build-up inside this country that people train you to have. And likewise, even when it comes to the concept of ilm that you find, people portray that. But you know, a damn good teacher and a damn good parent will always make sure there's a gap between you and them. That's something that we forget. There may be sometimes a person may excel and break that gap, but the natural norm is that the more that you grow up, the more wisdom that you find will begin to develop in them. Sometimes in our own lives, there's many things that our parents said, certain things that now, years later, you think, you know, that's exactly what my father said to me. And I was too arrogant and too rude to accept at that stage. And he said to me, one day you're going to accept it. And that's exactly what happens. What goes around, comes around. And that's why some of them mentioned this trivial story about the concept of what goes around, comes around. That one day, one individual said to his father, come on, let's go, to, I'll come with me, let's go to the, to the beach. Show, show you this nice, beautiful scenario. Picked up his father and threw him in the beach. Got rid of him. Years later, when he had his own son, his son grew up, said to him, Abi, come with me. I want to show you a nice, beautiful place. He said, what places have you got to show me? I've seen many of these places all around this area. There's nothing special. He goes, no, there's one place I want to show you. So he goes with the son, goes to exactly the same location, and he starts laughing. The son says, Abi, you're laughing. I'm about to throw you into the river, into the ocean, and you're laughing about it. He said, the reason why I'm laughing is some 20 years ago, I brought my dad to exactly the same place and I decided to throw him in that river and I did. So what goes around, comes around. If you believe or you behave rudely, harshly, incorrectly towards your parents, 
stubborn, arrogant, rude, foul mouth towards them. Don't be surprised tomorrow that when your kids grow up and they behave exactly like that towards you, then that time you're going to sit and reflect, you know, damn hell, that's exactly the same way I used to speak to my father. And look inside the Quran when it talks about Ibrahim salam, towards his father. His father is a kafir. He used to make the idols. How does he address him? Ya abati, lima ta'budu shaitan? Ya abati is a form of ghaya of the Arabic speech that you find it in impressed love. Love and devotion. Oh my father, why do you worship the shaitan? Years later, what happens? His son is a believer. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him inside the dream that he has to sacrifice his son. Ya bunaya inni ara fil manami anni adbahuka. Oh my son, I've seen in a dream, I have to sacrifice you. What's the response of Ismail? What's the response? Qala ya abati. O oh my beloved father. What did Ibrahim say to his father who's a kafir? Ya abati. Kama tadinu tadan. Ya abati fa'al ma tu'mar. Satajiduni insha'allahu minas sabirin. See how it come revolves around? Kafir father. Believing son. Believing father. Believing son. Exactly the same words, exactly the same expression, but totally different scenarios. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to send a tarbiyah lesson towards us of how we should yani, conduct ourselves. Likewise, we find, not forgetting the father as well, we find the hadith in the rated in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, لا يجزي ولد والدا إلا أن يجده مملوكا فيشتريه فيؤتقه There is no way that a son can pay back his father except for to find him as a slave and then to purchase him and set him free. Shuraf hadith have highlighted هذا مستحيل in general. It's not possible. It's not possible for a man to find his son, as his father, sorry, as a slave and to purchase him and set him free. So it's impossible for you to ever pay back your father. You and your wealth belong to your father. Likewise, we find the anger of your father entails the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't reflect upon that, do we sometimes? Everything else may be in right place. We may be praying, we may be living life according to sunnah. Everything's there, but something is just not right within the heart of the individual. Something is missing. There's a missing link. There's still some contentment I still haven't found. And maybe that wrath or that ill feeling or that rancor or that feeling inside your heart could be that your father may possibly be upset with you. Three supplications are answered without any doubt in the hadith of, in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari. A father who prays for his son, a traveler who prays whilst on a journey and an oppressed individual. These prayers are answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So imagine if your father's angry with you there's some fathers who may not pray for you. They may be cursing you. They may be cursing you. They may be reviling you. And that dua, unfortunately, may be traveling back up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what do we give back to them? Back to the mother and father, because if you think back in today's Western society, and we know most of us, we grew up with our parents. Do you ever remember a time when your father said to you, no. In general, most of us grew up inside the Western society. You want a pair of trainers. And you don't just want any pair of trainers. You want a pair of Nike Air TN. 125 pound, 150 pound, or I don't know what the price is at the moment. And what will your parents normally do? Or what will your father do normally? Buy them for you. Give you the money. One reason why we spoil our children, especially in the Asian culture, is we've given them everything. They don't need to work hard. They don't know what a hard day's work is. They just take over the family business, whatever it is, stroll in for an hour, half an hour, then get on with their life, and they think that they're working hard. And our parents, when they came here, they had to take care of their children, their family, and their family back home, 
and the community and establish an Islamic environment to the best of the ability, and they fulfill that. Now the trust lies upon us, and we can't even take on the role or the trust of our own families. Why? A lack of barakah, a lack of blessing inside our approach and understanding of Islam. So we find that as they get older, the natural sunnah is that they're going to, they're going to die. They're going to go into a state of weakness if they reach that age. So it's upon the Muslim to show that companionship and that goodness towards one's parents when they're getting to that age. Once again, you find psychologically that you find that parents, as they become elderly, they become once again like children. If I'm mistaken, then let me know. If your father says, this is white, and you say it's black, he says, no, it's white. What do you have to do? You have to accept it just like a child because their mental state and their age is returning back to the same concept of being like a child. The Quran mentions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created from a state of weakness. Then after a state of weakness gave you strength, gave you ability. Then after that you find after this quwa becomes weakness and becoming grey-haired or becoming feeble, becoming old. That's the natural norm that we find. So one returns back to that same role that they began with as a child. And even you find that the, the bodily components, etc. What happens? Can't control their bowels, etc. Whatever it may be. And for us, it may seem any gruesome, etc. But it's people out there who wash their parents, who bathe their parents, take care of their parents. That may be a suburb for them to help them to get swiftly into paradise. That service that they do. For us, it may seem repulsive and, you know, maybe get a cleaner to do it or get someone else to do it or hire someone to do it. But it's a large portion of people out there in the Muslim community in Muslim world who still have these ethics that we may see them as culture but they see them as Islam we see it as a culture you know we want to criticize the cultural approach that cultural approach is deep teachings of Islam and that's you find that this woman by journalist by the name of Susan Duncan or Emma Duncan wrote this famous book breaking the curfew and in this book she writes as a journalist that she travels through Pakistan and she meets numerous politicians and people in power, General Zia, Nawaz Sharif, Benazir Bhutto, and all other different personalities that you find there. And she visits so many different ministers. And in a journey, she has to mix with a certain young Muslim man. And on that journey, obviously being a non-Muslim, she drinks and he offers her drinks, and he sometimes joins in drinking with her. And they went to various ministers, and they would openly drink, and she would drink, etc. One day, they went to the boy's home. And so the father served the drinks. She drank. He may have drunk as well. I don't remember exactly what took place, but I do recall. If she looked at him, he didn't drink anything. When they came out the house, she said, throughout this journey, on various occasions, we sat together, you would join and you would drink, etc. Why didn't you drink today? He goes, my mother probably knows that I drink. Uh, sorry, my father, but I never drank in front of his face. She writes in this book, this is a great big slap in the face of the West. We don't have such etiquettes and teachings. Yes, we all sin. Remember that. Human beings will sin. But Islam says to curtail and control and keep the hid sin a hidden sin. I've seen grown-up men at the age of 50 or 60 walking by past their parents and they're smoking and as soon as they see their parents placing that cigarette inside their hand and burning their hand. Grown up men. What do we find in our society? When we was growing up in school, most of the non-Muslims, what would happen to them? Their parents would say to them, go and buy your own cigarettes, your own fags. Don't smoke mine. That's the normal norm for them. They don't even see it as a sin. If you want to do it, go and do it on your own back. Same thing is beginning to now take place amongst Muslims as well. 
you may be doing a sin, doing something incorrect, keep it to yourself. Don't think, well, I do it, may as well just let my children get involved inside these evil actions. Likewise, you find the concept of the haram that we earn. A large portion of Muslim community, they complain about our children don't listen to us. Because sometimes the earnings that we do are haram. You have a fully licensed restaurant selling alcohol, selling liquor. Well, it's only to the non-Muslims, they're the customers. But hadith in Sahih Muslim is clear about the 10 individuals and different categories that you find. So you may have not drunk or you never drank in your life. But eventually, someone in the family has become an alcoholic via that business or the earnings of that business. There's no barakah left. And then we want to come to the Imam and say, well, what should I do about my son or my child now? Or we find the concept of drug dealing inside a community is gone to such a level. And if you talk about it, it's just a great big taboo. That's a real issue that we're dealing with. There's a large portion of Muslim youth who involve in the trafficking of drugs. The Bradford Connection, 40 million pounds worth of heroin that you find. But we won't address these issues. And part and partial, the reason is why we're suffering from this is because the type of lifestyles that we had. That the role of the masjid is to educate the child. It's not my role. It's not my task. I paid the masjid. They should just teach him. So where was you as a father? The gun crime, the culture that you find inside this country of violence, of problems, of many of the teenagers has been concluded once again to studies that there was no fatherly figure in the home. There was no fatherly figure. They had no one to look up to, no one to respect, no one to control them. So they go out on a rampage and they behave in this manner. And you know, as a side point, we as Muslims, some of us are creating exactly the same society without even recognizing it. You know how? In our concept of we're reviving the sunnah of getting married two, three or four times. It may sound strange, but that's the reality of what we're creating inside our society. In your revival of the sunnah, you're leaving your children at what? Leaving a state of negligence. It's not one of those sunnahs that you have to do, that you're sinful if you don't do it, but some people have placed such an emphasis upon it and not focus upon what does it really mean? Ar-rijalu qawwamuna ala nisa bima faddallallahu ba'dahum ala ba'd. What does that mean? Ar-rijalu qawwamuna ala nisa. The whole concept of rujula, qawwama, you study in the Arabic language, understanding. It's not just sexual carnage desires. That's not what it means. It means the ability to take care of everything around with your family. Ya yu ladina amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Or you believe save yourselves and your family from the hellfire. So that's the prime role of the real family member or the head of the family member. Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ul an ra'iyatihi. All of you is a shepherd. Is a leader and is responsible for the flock underneath him. Not someone else is responsible. Not someone else is going to come and give that tarbiyah. And then we want to come back and complain about the upbringing of our children, etc. that we find. No, we have to predominantly take that role within our own hands. So we also find that the concept of towards our parents as we find, وَخْفِدْ لَهُمَا يَنِي جَنَاحَ الظُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ Lower the wings of humility, of compassion towards them. Don't raise your voice, as ulama of tafasir mentioned, in front of them. Don't raise your voice above your parents. Hatta you find that some of the ulama of you find some strange writings when it comes. That some of them, whilst they're eating with their mother, don't want to place their hand on something, lest their mother wants to eat that piece, morsel of food, etc. That she wants that. You know, but for us, this sounds once again culture, sounds trivial. Sounds something, you know, way out. You know, we're talking about reviving the sunnah, but where's this concept of reviving the sunnah amongst the way? Some of them highlight, ulama of tazkir, they highlight, not to walk in front of your parents. Walk at their side or walk behind them. Never go ahead of them. And we all know the famous 
hadith talking about the concept of seeking a form of intermediary of our actions, of gaining ourselves into, into paradise, of the three men inside the hadith of Bukhari, if I'm not mistaken, of how they were locked in a, in a cave. And a great big boulder came and it trapped them in. So what did one of the men say? He highlight, highlighted that every night he comes home and he doesn't go to sleep except by giving a bowl of milk, etc. to his parents and then he goes to see his own children and his own family members. But Ya Rab, you know one day I was delayed. I came back late and I found my parents were asleep. And my own children were crying and waiting for the milk, etc. You know, Ya Rab, what I did? I stood there and I remained there until they awoke. And when they awoke in their sleep, I presented the bowl of milk to them. And they drank it and they went back to sleep and I went to my family. So he could have come back at a different stage. He could have gone home, but he remains there. You know, Ya Rab, I've done that sincerely for your face. Total sincerity and showing respect not to show them any harm, any difficulty. And so we know that there's a slight amount of the rock in the open and the rest of the hadith it continues in the rest of the journey which doesn't concern us at this stage. But once again it shows a concept of immense respect and devotion to be shown towards one's parents. May that man's nose be rubbed in dust. May that man's nose be rubbed in dust. May the individual's nose be rubbed in dust. Hadith in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. Man adraka abawayhi inda al kibari ahadahuma o kilayhima, falam yad khulil jannah. May that man's nose be rubbed in dust three times. The form of dis disgrace according to the Arabic language. That he finds either one of his parents or two of his parents at a state of old age and he does not enter into paradise. Because you know why? Your prime opportunity to serve your parents. It's presented there right in front of you that this is your door to paradise. And you don't take that door. You're a wretched individual. That's what you've become. No matter how great you may claim to be, but you're wretched, according to the Sharia. Because you have failed to enter into paradise. And you find in various narrations talking about some ulama authenticating that paradise lies underneath the feet of your mother. And some of them even highlighted, some of the Salaf, they mentioned that when their mother died, they highlighted, now I only have one gate. And when their father died, they said, I have no gates to enter into paradise now, because all opportunity has been taken away from me. So imagine many of us, our parents who may have left this dunya, etc., they may not be alive. Those were two gates to get into paradise. And we lost that opportunity to stroll into paradise. We find that a man increases in wisdom and behavior is defined according to the Quran. When a man reaches his strength and reaches the age of 40, 40 is the age of wisdom, 40 is the age of nubuwa, the age of prophethood. That's when a man at the age of 40, the prime time of his life, then begins to reflect and begin to think, Oh my Lord, if only I could give you any thanks to you or the blessings that the bounties you placed upon me, that I should be grateful towards any my parents. And for some people, it may be too late. And you find out what do most parents, what are they calling towards? The experience of life is calling towards goodness as the ayah continues. Or it mentions as well, وَهُمَا يَسْتَغِيثَانِ اللَّهِ وَيْلَكَ آمِنْ إِنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقٍّ they're calling out, Oh my son, oh my daughter, believe. Believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna wa'dallahi haq. Indeed, the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a reality, is true. And this individual turned around and says, These are just tales of the ancients. Ancient fables and tales you're telling me about. I'm going to go back to face Allah. There's going to be a day of judgment. It's going to be day of resurrection. What type of stories are these? 
We find that amongst Muslim youth. That's what we find. Ancient tales these are. There's no returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's going to be no accountability. And you know, this ancient tales doesn't just come from people who may be the average individual. There's sophisticated, educated Muslims. They believe that they think that the akhirah and all of this is just ancient tales. You find some of them in their snobbery and their academia and their richness and their poshness that you find. That when they're standing next to their, their father, or someone may mention because their father doesn't speak English with an accent or something, and they ask that, who was that man next to you? Oh, I don't know who that man was. <laughs> Just ignore him. Think about that. That's what some of these people have reached in the level of their snobbery of education. They think they've become, they don't remember that their father may have been washing dishes to make sure you get to a damn good school and you have a damn good education. Days and nights that he spent trying to make sure you got the best education. Now you become what you've become and this is the way you treat your parents in your quote unquote, I'm a civilized, educated individual. That's what these civilized people do with their parents. As we began with, they throw them in that old age pensioners home because parents are getting in the way of my life. And that's exactly what some of us are beginning to follow. That they're getting in the way of my life. And thus you find that even when it comes to such a degree that some parents have that farasa, they have that insight. I'm not saying this becomes a hujjah, that we should use this for all parents. But when Umar said to his son, Ibn Umar, divorce your, your wife, talliq her. And obviously he loved her, he had immense love towards her. He asked the Prophet Muhammad, what should I do? He said, if your father said, if he said it, divorce her. Because Umar was one of those individuals who had inspiration given to him. He had that form of divine inspiration upon him. He had the ability to see the foresight of certain things. So he should obey his father at this instant because he's not speaking of his whims and desires or as we may speak, our own cultural background, our language, our tribes, etc. He's speaking out of justice and equity and seeing something isn't right about this woman or this yani, individual. Abu Darda, we find a man came and said, I have a wife and my mother orders me to divorce her. I heard the Prophet Muhammad saying that the father parent is the middle door of paradise, lose it or keep it. So take that advice. So if it's justified according to his sharia, in his correct context, in his correct form, without any personal interest, then a person even to such a degree needs to listen to such advice. So it's all something to ponder and to reflect and to think about the, the sublime you know, prestige position of the parents. Even greater than jihad. You know, there's a lot of individuals out there thinking they're going out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, for some of you studied the whole psychological concept, some of them are just trying to run away from their responsibilities. That's what some people are trying to do and trying to use that as a, as a decoy that we're going to do something. Hadith in Bukhari Muslim. Ja'a rajulun fasta'adhanahu fil jihad. A man came and sought permission to go out for jihad. Faqala ahayyun walidak. He said, are your parents living? Qala na'am. Fafihima fajahid. Go back and make your jihad and struggle in taking care of them. These are general principles inside Islam that people say, well, any jihad, fardul ayn, I don't need to listen to my parents, I can just walk out, I can do whatever I want to do. Where do such teachings come from? Where do such influences come from? So placing everything in context, hadith is quite clear and explicit. Man is seeking permission to go out and do a noble action. But the Prophet Muhammad is advising him to go back, if your parents are alive, to go back and to take care of them. Even if your parents are quote unquote kuffar, disbelievers, non-Muslims. But that's another problem we find. Muslims say, we become Muslims. You know, why should I show respect to, to my parents or treat them well, etc. Who are kafir here, kafirah. What does the Sharia say about this? of our treatment towards them, we find وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا The Qur'an says, remain towards them in a companionship of goodness. Something which is good. If your parents are non-Muslims and they say to you, son, wash the car. Wash the car. If they say paint the house, paint the house. If they say clean up, clean up. It's got nothing to do with it. Dad, you're a filthy kafir. I'm a believer now. 
There's no link. There's no relationship. Nothing to do with it. But if he says, son, let's celebrate Christmas together. Let's cut the turkey. Let's drink together. Let's go and call him Christ today. Then what happens? Then you draw the line. That's where you draw the line. So you find that to, to greet them on their greetings, we find this festive period, the moment, the prosperous new year, etc. that we find. The way of the believers. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا Once again, the sifat of the believers inside the end of Surah Al-Furqan. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ don't, Who don't stand testimony to falsehood, false speech, vanity, evil practices. Imam Al-Mufassirin, Ibn Kathir mentions, is أَعْيَادُ mushrikeen the celebrations of the polytheists and the days which are specific to them. That person should not en engage in any form of greeting towards them. But any other occasion, ask how they are, how their health is, take care of them, so to hear the death of so-and-so, or this harmed you, that's allowed in the Sharia for a Muslim to do, conduct themselves. So one should have that tawazun, that balance. Asma that we find, radiallahu ta'ala anha, yani, asking that her mother he a mushrika, she's a polytheist. She's coming to, well, he a raghiba, she's coming to meet me and to see me and to visit me. What should I do? She's worried. The Prophet Muhammad says to her, Naam, sili ummak. Make the ties of your mother. Strengthen the ties with your mother. Innama ta'atu fil ma'roof. Ta'a, obedience, is in the good things. There's no obedience in the bad things. So imagine if more and more. Of the people who become Muslims or people who become practicing again begin to show goodness towards their parents. There will be such a great impact upon them, even if they don't, may not become Muslims, but it shows a better image and a devotion of the teachings of Islam. The only time we give up their obedience is when they encourage disobedience, as we mentioned in the concept of shirk in the Quran as well. So in jahadaka, they strive against you, they force you, or they're convincing you to do something, don't obey them. Show no devotion towards them. That's it. You draw the line. This is as far as my relationship goes with you. Likewise, in Surah Luqman, once again, in jahadaka so once again, Remain a good comrade, a companion with them in goodness inside this world. Is how a Muslim should be towards any one's parents, whether they're Muslims or they're non-Muslims. And that relationship, as the ulama mentioned, even spills over. As you find, Al khalatu bi manzilatil um, the aunt, the maternal aunt is in the position of the mother because you find that the aunt, the khala, resembles the mother the most in her voice, in her etiquette, in her speech, has the most right to take care of the child as well and likewise keeping ties and that's why you find the whole concept of rahim, if you study it linguistically rahim goes back to the concept, it also spreads to the concept of showing mercy and compassion and that soft place of the womb that we find that one should keep the ties with the family members keep good ties with them and you find even some ulama brings various narrations talking about a hadith or certain athar that we find that even the family members the friends of your father that you should show goodness towards them the story of Abdullah ibn Umar whereby once he saw an individual got down gave him his donkey to ride gave him his turban and said look how the easy you know, the Bedouin is satisfied with small things why did you do such actions? Because he was the friend of my father. So showing goodness to them is a way of showing goodness to one's father. In Nabar al Birri Silatul Rajuli Ahla Wuddi Abihi. To show those people who your father loved, had association with, to show goodness and kindness towards them. So in conclusion, we find this concept, what all that we've been discussing in discussing, if you go back to various works of Ahadith. Even basic works like the collection of Imam Nawi's Riyadh al-Salihin and other books on hadith that you find, the concept of Bab Tahrim al-Aquq al-Walidain. The chapter is talking about severing the ties of one's parents. Min al-Kabair. 
amongst the major sins. The major sins. And you can go back also look at Imam Dahabi's al kabair the 80 odd or 90 odd, any major sins that he collects inside there. Amongst the major sins you find, obviously, first is al ishraku billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you find, wa'ququl walidain. Severing the ties of relationship towards your parents. Min al kabair shatmur rajuli walidayhi. From amongst the major sins is for a man to swear, to curse, to revile his parents. Yasubbu aba rajul fa yasubbu abahu. You curse another man's father, and you know what happens? He swears at your father. So you are really cursing your own father. So one should be careful with one's tongue. Don't say something to someone else's mother or father, because then they could say something about your mother and father, and you've just actually cursed your own mother and father. And we know the street language at the moment, isn't it? Many of the youth are talking, isn't it? Your mum, your dad, isn't it? The type of language that they use. And you study what that means, what that really means. As you're reviling your own parents. You're showing disrespect towards your own parents. Aqukul ummahat. Severing the ties of motherhood. The rights which belong you need to one's mother. And amongst the signs of the, the Day of Judgment that we find that famous hadith, the hadith of Jibra'il alayhi salam, at the end of the hadith, you find that concept, what are amongst its ashrat, what are amongst the signs of the Day of Judgment, you find inside the wording, You find a slave girl will give birth to her master or to her mistress. One interpretation by the ulama of hadith, of this interpretation or this section of the hadith is, that you'll find disrespectful children treating their parents like slaves. Treating their parents like slaves is one interpretation that ulama made regarding this hadith. Something to begin to think about. That is amongst the signs or the minor signs of the day of judgment that people begin to show disrespect towards any, their parents. Two sins are punished immediately in this world. Injustice and disobedience to one's parents in the mustadrak of Imam Hakim that we find this hadith is authenticated by the late muhaddith Sheikh Nasruddin Al Albani Rahmatullah Ali. Two sins are punished immediately in this world injustice and disobedience to one's parents. Swift punishment is brought upon you in this dunya whilst you're living. So, in conclusion, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To make our children and following the characteristics of the belief inside Surah Al Furqan, Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zuriyatina qurrata a'yun wa jalna lil muttaqina imama. Make our children to become the coolness and our the coolness of our eyes. Imam Suyuti making or mentioning tafsir this verse highlights, because many of us think coolness of the eyes refers to what the akhirah is, isn't it? The coolness, the tenderness of our eyes. Goes to this interpretation that they become the coolness of your eyes. In this world, that when you see your children upon salah, upon righteousness, upon piety, upon good actions, praying, reading the Quran, reciting, fasting, that rejoices your heart. But we rejoice, unfortunately, in our hearts, seeing our children involved in haram, doing haram actions. We thrive upon that. You know, how in our culture, what is it? You know, the child is, is dancing. Oh, look, he's dancing, everyone. Look, he's dancing. But if he's praying or doing something else, oh, what's happened to him? <laughs> Everything's topsy-turvy for us. The real supplication of the believer is to see his children in a state of righteousness that becomes coolness of his eyes inside this world. And likewise, once again, what can you leave behind? Many of us, we can't leave behind ilm. We can't maybe leave behind other actions, charitable actions. But imagine you leave, give a good tarbiyah to your son or your daughter. Waladun salih yad'u lahu A righteous son prays for you Righteous daughter prays for you Dua goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Will benefit you So sometimes we need to begin to focus more On the closer people Closer to us And make them become Benefiters and individuals Who will benefit us deeply When we turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And trying to go and Maybe at times benefit other individuals Not to say it's incorrect And seek those individuals And benefit them And the ones close ones around us We begin any to Forget them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq and the ability to remove this hypocrisy in everything that I've mentioned, nothing being textual and academic research because most of us you know, 
I can point the finger at my own self, are negligent in many of these things that we've touched upon about our parents and give us the strength and ability to live true to these words, become those individuals, الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلَ وَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَ Listen to the words and implement to the best of the ability. Anything good I've said has been nothing but the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything incorrect has been for my own self, the wisdom of shaitan. وَقُولُوا قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُوا اللَّهِ وَلَكُمْ وَلِجَمِيلِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ فَاسْتَغْفِرُونَ وَالْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمِ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُ بِحَمْدِكَ شُرَ اللَّهِ إِلَا إِلَا أَنْ تَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَتُوبُوا لَيْكُمْ جزاكم الله خير. غربا غربا